Okay. Yeah, I'm filming this this is for the people that aren't here, so I'll put it up on Moodle. Plus, it's a good opportunity. Thank you, guys. If you, you know, you can't quite remember or you want to re-look at it, etc. Excuse me, I've got a bit of a cold starting, so if I'm a bit bummed up and whatever, just tell me to speak a bit clearer. All right, sorry, can I speak clearer? Speak clearer. Yeah, oh, thank you. No more, thank you. What I want to talk about is the last solar pack for the year. And it's this one. ED1 MT Solar M Prod. M Prod is short for music production. So this solar pack is Sorry, associated. Sorry, mate. Oi, shush, sit down, come on. Sorry, I'm late. Just come in and sit down, be quiet. Oh, no. Get note taken stuff. Wait. Solar. The last one for the year is this one. M prod. John, turn around, have a look so you know what we're talking about. M prod. Music production, okay? This one <coughs> is associated with the music production unit. So far you've done a mix which was in the mix, that assignment we had to mix the strokes track, that mix out from four. Outcomes two and three are to do with your involvement in recording sessions, what your activities have been like, how you've you know, been in those sessions. Outcome number one, though, asks you to explain manufacturer specifications for a range of audio equipment. Now, uh, if you haven't already, most of you won't have, enrolled on this, just click home and then somewhere down the right hand side here it will say find or search courses. Just type in MPROD and then you can enrol yourself on this course. Okay? Now this concerns the first outcome. So it is very important that you actually put a bit of effort into this one. Because, and it even says this further down, as I've said before with some units you might do some amazing practical work but one of the outcomes lets you down, namely the sequencing. Some of you guys have submitted some great sequencing tracks, but the screenshot work that is super important because it meets an outcome was either non-existent or poor, so it brought the whole grade down. Same scenario here, guys. This is important. Now, this solar pack, I'll read it to you so you're all aware. Uh, here we go. Welcome to the final solar pack for your first year's study. This solar pack focuses solely on one outcome and cannot be met through the other assignments you have already completed. As I've explained on many occasions, if you put in some fantastic practical work in the studio, it can all be let down by this one outcome. Okay, so it's vital that you try hard. The aim of this outcome of the solar pack is to help to develop your knowledge of the technical specification of a range of studio equipment, which can include, but is not limited, to microphones. We've all done plenty of work for SSI, so you can use that work. Monitors or speakers, such as these. <coughs> yeah. A recorder, maybe the HD24, maybe some outboard equipment, the compressors, effects, things like that. The one thing that's not there, what's would you say is a main piece of equipment in the recording studio? Yes. The mixing desk. Yeah, you can talk about a mixing desk. Okay. Your task is to research and provide an explanation of three pieces of studio equipment using the manufacturer's specification to support your work. You have much experience of this from your solar pack. You know when you were talking about the mics and you were saying, oh yeah, it's a frequency response of 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, and you found the frequency response chart explain things like that. To have you on your way, you can find the PDF manuals for much of the studio equipment you've got. Uh, I've got to know now our studio, but not all of it is there. So if you just go to Google and type in whatever the piece of equipment is, and type user guide or user manual. Okay? And you can see there, I put just a few resources for you underneath. The add-ons and the monitors, there's their manual. The AKG mic, uh, there's a guide to monitors, the road mic shore, there's the Soundcraft Ghost, that's the mixing console, that's the user manual there. There's a couple of websites for information for you to look at, to help, and a few videos as well. Okay, so I've put a fair few resources there for you to have a look at. 
But what I want to do now is just talk you through and give you kind of the bare bones information, if you will, to get you going, you know, things to think about when you're working on this task, okay? Is there any questions so far? Does it all seem fairly straightforward? In a nutshell, Henry, what are you going to do? Explain three pieces of studio equipment using the spec to support. Make sense? Good. Put diagrams in, you know, include, include that kind of stuff. Okay, put a picture up there. What is that a picture of? Speakers. They are speakers, yeah, but they are particular studio monitors. monitors. Yeah, monitors. Okay, slightly different to just standard speakers. Okay, so yeah, so you said studio monitors. Any other terms? Any other terms? Monitors. Sorry? No. Yeah, got monitors. Any other names? What about near field? Oh, near field reference monitors. Struggling to write. Near field reference monitors. Now, someone, I think perhaps trying jokingly, said far field, yeah? Who said that? Yeah. What are far field monitors then? Far field, further from the wall. Near field monitors are designed so that you are, you are near to them, okay? So you're in a smallish space. Think about the recording studio. Is that room a big room? Where the mixing desk is, is that a big room? No. No, not really. So those speakers have actually been designed to be listened to fairly close. You know, two to three metres away. Tops. Does that make sense? Okay. And they're near field monitors. The far field monitors that you get, uh, you'll see some studios where the, the speakers are actually mounted in, in the wall. They're almost like PA speakers, big massive ones that are designed to fill huge spaces. Okay. Now, what does it mean by reference, though? What's, what's this reference term going on about? Anybody just has a guess? Reference. Okay, so let's put it in this context. Has anybody ever looked at buying a hi-fi? You know, a stereo for, hi for the home? Yes. Yeah. Okay. What kind of things do the manufacturers try and sell? What do they try and make the stereo, the hi-fi system, sound like it's good at? Everything. Like what, though? What do you mean, like, all the different EQs it has? Go on, keep going. Surround sound. Surround sound. Bass. Bass. That's the big one, isn't it? X bass! You know, triple boom bass, three subwoofers, 2,000 watts sub. The bass, yeah? bass. Most hi-fi speakers try and sell the fact that they're really bass. Yeah? And they're great for listening to... Guys, they're good for listening to dance music and that kind of stuff. Okay? Now, when you buy those hi-fi systems or stereos, what are you anticipating? When you press play with your music, it's going to be what? Powerful. Good. It's going to be powerful, they're going to be loud, and they're going to be basic. So what does that mean? The manufacturer of that hi-fi system has done to the sound. Bass boost. With the bass boost, yeah. They, they will make the bass sound louder. So is that actually accurate to the original recording? No, it's lying. You can't turn it off on the sun. Say that again, Joe. Lying. It is lying, isn't it? In a sense, yeah. They're trying to beef the sound up and make it bigger and whatever and stronger. But it's not true. So, here's the idea. Let's say then, Brandon's recorded a band. Brandon's recorded a band. And he takes all those tracks home, like you've done with Brian Storm and um, Will's track. You take those tracks home and you actually putting your laptop through the hi-fi and mixing the track on that stereo. What's the problem? You're not going to hear it again. Other people are going to hear it. That's right. You're not going to hear it as other people will hear it. Because you'll be listening to that track going, wow, that's bassy, and you might turn the bass down. And then when you burn it on disc and take it round to your friend's house and put it on their stereo, it's not bassy. 
you might go, well, oh, there's no base. Does that make sense? Because you tried to compensate for the fact that Brandon's stereo is extra bassy. So what do we want from... What do we want from our monitors? Flat response, don't we? We don't want our speakers to boost the low end. We don't want them to change or colour the sound. We want them to be flat. Does that make sense? So we're actually going to use them to reference material. We want to hear the sound exactly as it was when it was recorded. Does that make sense? And that's what studio monitors or near-field reference monitors are designed to do. They're designed to be natural sounding, flat response, so that you can actually use them to reference material, to actually listen and analyse material as it should sound. Okay? And the companies that make these have spent a lot of time and money in research and development to make those speakers flat frequency response. And there's, you know, as natural sound in it, if you will, as they are. Okay, so near field monitors. What's the ideal listening position with two speakers? Like this? So the speakers are firing like that? No, you want them. No, no. Really, you want them at an angle towards your ears. Right in your face. So the kitchen thing, yeah, the of things, so things, 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 like an equilateral triangle, yes. Good. Ooh. Where have you learned that? General knowledge. Is it general knowledge? <laughs> yeah. Or have you talked about it in acoustics? Uh, no. No? Yeah. yeah? Some people have nodded. Yeah, okay. So, when we're talking about actual monitors themselves, studio monitors, okay, there are ways to classify them. Now, these loudspeakers, there's a pair here, okay, you always buy them, you can buy them individually, some people sell them as individual, uh, but generally you at least want a pair, why, no, do you want a pair? If you have one, you know, just... one equals mono, mono. oh yeah, yeah, mono. So two, two wow. equals stereo, yeah. that's right, so a left and a right speaker, for sure, so you get a stereo image, make sense? Now, these monitors are what we call two-way monitors. Now, what does that mean? Yeah, call it. A tweeter and uh, a tweeter and a woofer. Okay. Two-way means there are two speakers. Okay. And in the typical system, you have a... Oh, sorry. With my Wrong speakers, way there. With my speakers, it's generally just double woof. A tweeter and a woofer. The tweeter is generally smaller in size and outputs what frequencies? The high frequencies. So the tweeter is for the high frequencies and the woofer, the larger diameter driver, is for the low. Yeah, it's for the bass, however you want to describe that. Now, this type of an enclosure, and I'll come back to all the bits of information in a moment, this type of box that it's in, this is called the enclosure. And this type of enclosure is called a ported enclosure. So what does that mean? And these, these ones here, look guys, these are examples of ported enclosures. Because it's got, oh, yeah, not ports. Now, what do the ports do? <coughs> yeah, so this is to do with air. Yeah, isn't it like? Yeah, because on a lot of speakers, you when you have bases, bases speakers, you do feel like the air is like How does a speaker work? Okay. It vibrates. Yeah, kind of. Sorry? Yeah. 
Electricity is passed through a coil of wire. And that coil of wire is wrapped around almost, you know when you've finished the toilet roll and you're left with a cardboard tube? Yeah? So if you imagine that cardboard tube with a very, very tightly coiled copper coil, okay, wrapped around it. If you pass electricity through that coil, not a lot happens. <coughs> but at the back of the speaker there's a magnet. And if that copper coil is suspended within the magnetic field, and you pass electricity through it, it will make the speaker move, dependent on whether it's a positive or negative amount of electricity. Okay, like your sign levels. So it will move the speaker. And when the speaker moves, it pushes out. Do you agree? Now, that's all well and good though, with this speaker. When it moves forward, where does the air go? Back. Forward. Yeah, when the speaker moves forward, it pushes the air into the room. Do you agree? But when it goes backwards, what happens to the air movement? It goes, yeah, into the enclosure and it's pushed out of those holes, out of the ports. Now, uh, who has, everyone's done this, I'm sure. You know when you get like an empty bottle and you blow over the top? What happens? Great. Yeah. Is it? Make the noise? Right. Not, not so. So, have we all done that? Yeah, you get a bottle and you blow over the top and it makes that noise. That noise is the sound of the bottle resonating. Okay? I'm going to do it then. Oh, 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 let down. Still there we go. Come on, try. Mm. Oh, we've got a little it's bit. It's just you making that noise. Oh. Hang on, Harry's going for it. Look at him, he's going for it. Quick, take a look, quick, take a look. <coughs> Science experiment here, guys. Drink of it. Drink of it. You can't blow it directly over. You've got to blow it over. Don't tell me how to do what I do best. You clearly go like that. That's it. Now, what happens? Hang on, guys. That's enough. What happens if Harry keeps drinking the liquid? He will need the sounds to pitch. The pitch gets lower because the volume inside the bottle has increased. The idea gets transferred across to the ports. If you change the size of these ports, you can actually change the frequency at which these ports will resonate. Okay? Much exactly the same principle as this. And again, the manufacturers of these monitors have researched and developed the size of those ports and have tuned the actual enclosure to resonate at a certain frequency. Now why would they want a loudspeaker box to resonate at a certain frequency? To boost a certain frequency. To actually help, I'm going to draw it here now that that's drawn, I'm going to draw this. What is this I'm drawing? F for frequency, G for gain. Here is the response to my loudspeaker. Uh, let's do 20 kilohertz, 20 hertz. So in the high frequency, it's quite responsive, but as it gets down to the very low frequency, let's say around 50 hertz, it starts to lose response. Yeah. If we put 20 hertz into this loudspeaker, will it be able to recreate it? No. Uh, that's what <laughs> Okay. It loses its ability to actually output that frequency. So our loudspeaker at around about 50 hertz now, starts to drop off. So here's a good idea. Let's tune these ports, these ports, so that they resonate at 50 hertz. Yeah? So that then we actually get an extended bass response. Does that make sense? So the loudspeaker enclosure will actually help deliver 50 hertz because we've tuned the loudspeaker enclosure, should I say. We haven't, if that makes sense. Yeah, you look at ICE systems. What are ICE systems? In-car entertainment. You know, when you see the boy racers, Kevs, or whatever you call them around here. Kevs. Um, Kevs. And they have the large subs in the boot of their car. Yeah? They'll actually have the enclosures tuned, large ports, don't they, in those, to get down to maybe 35 hertz, so they can really go... 
you know, right down to the low three. Okay, so I'm just going to just going to wipe that off. If anyone wants to copy that down. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, just <laughs> John, get just by break. Oi, 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 calm down. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John. Now, these loudspeakers actually have a switch, so you can turn them on. So what does that mean they require? Power. 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 Electricity. Now, why would a loudspeaker require power? Why would a loudspeaker require electricity? It has an amplifier. Okay. So these speakers and these ones here, these add-ons, these are what are called active. Now active means that the loudspeaker has an, an amplifier inside. So actually inside this box, there is an amplifier and the speakers. So that the signal from your mixing desk or whatever it may be, goes into the speaker, the amplifier boosts the signal, and then it powers the speaker. Okay. Now, how many actual amplifiers do you think are inside Two. one of these? No, one. These, both of these examples are actually called bi amplified. Bi meaning two. Two. There's two amplifiers inside these speakers. Now, one amp. Oi, oi, shh. That video's rolling. I want them to be able to hear what I'm saying. Bi amplified. Oi. Bi amplified. Two amplifiers. Okay. One amplifier to drive and power what? The woofer. And a smaller amplifier to power the tweeter. The tweeter. Okay. So, does that make sense? Yes. By amplified, active, two way, near field reference monitors. We've covered quite a lot of stuff already for this assignment, and it's all very basic. There is an issue though, and this is where it gets slightly more complicated, but not so that I don't think you understand. I've got a track, any track, doesn't matter what it is, and it's got drums, it's got bass guitar, it's got electric guitar, it's got keyboard, piano, vocals, harmony vocals, synth, it's got the lot. What happens if I send the whole bandwidth that means 20 hertz all the way to 20 kilohertz. So the kick drum all the way to the hi hat. What happens if I send all of that sound to the tweeter? Is this little speaker here designed to, app, to, to play, if you will, a kick drum? The answer is no, it's not. So what might happen to it? It'll break. It'll break. It'll clip, it'll store, and ultimately it'll break. Here's the flip side. If I've got a speaker that's 15 inches in diameter, so it's about this big. Okay. Hold that thought. If I say 16 kilohertz, this frequency, what does that mean? Give me in a max style lesson. What does 16 kilohertz mean? 16,000 hertz. But what's, what are we talking about? Talking eight times completely within the human hair. Thank you. 16,004 cycles of the sine wave, positive, negative, positive, negative, per second. So if this loudspeaker at the top is going to output 16 kilohertz, 16,000 forward, backward movements per second, that speaker's got to move really quickly, hasn't it? Now, Transfer that across to, sh to the 15 inch speaker. Can a 15 inch speaker that big go forwards and backwards 16,000 times in a second? Probably could struggle really. It might be able to, question mark, but most likely it's going to struggle big time. So it's not great. 
So how do we get over this problem? Basically, I don't want 16 kilohertz going to my woofer. And I don't want 80 hertz, a bass drum, going to my tweeter. So how, how do I do that? What, how do I only say, you, these frequencies go to this speaker, and these frequencies go to that speaker? How do I do that? The cables. It's before the amplifiers. Not... Yeah, it's something called a crossover. Okay. Now, what does allegedly a filter in a cigarette do? It takes out the unnecessary dirty. It takes out the bad stuff. A filter removes something, doesn't it? And in, in circuitry, in, in you know the digital world, and analog circuitry, a filter can be set up to remove certain frequencies. Okay? So, in a diagram sense, our loudspeaker, uh, I'll just do it over here for a second, again, 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. This could be our song look, energy from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. But what I want to happen is I want a filter to say anything above 2 kilohertz I want you to actually kill. So it only lets through from 20 hertz up to about 2 kilohertz. And everything else above that, it filters off. Does that make sense? And then that energy goes to which speaker? The woofer or the tweeter? Does it think, Will? The woofer. And on the flip side, another filter saying anything below. 2 kilohertz, filter out, and send. There. Does that make sense? So it actually takes the signal and filters out some of the frequency content. So that only certain frequencies go to one speaker, only certain frequencies go to the other. It's called a crossover. Okay. All speakers have them in. They're not there. That'll have, a, that'll have a passive one, which is actually components on a circuit board. Some of them have digital crossovers, but we'll worry about that next year. Okay? So it's just a filter that takes out certain frequencies. You're playing a guitar in a guitar amp, right? And your EQ is set central, bass in the middle, middle in the middle, treble in the middle. If you turn down the treble, what have you just done? You've reduced the gain in the high end, haven't you? Yeah? If you could do it so that it actually removes it altogether, not just turns it down, but turns it down so much you, there's zero, there's nothing there, that's all that's happened. Okay? Does that make sense? Sorry. So we talked a little bit there about reference monitors, what they are, why we have them. We want them to be very detailed, very accurate, flat response. Near field monitors means they're designed to be used in smaller spaces. You know, so I sit here with those loudspeakers. I'm going to have a computer here or a mixing desk. I don't want to be 500 feet away. I want to be near all the equipment, don't I? Okay, so they're designed to be listened to close up. Okay. They, these ones are two-way, two-way meaning there's two speakers, low frequency, high frequency. And the signal that's sent to them is filtered out via a crossover. Okay, people have just taken notes, so I'm going to move on to uh, another topic in a second. This little picture here. Okay. Right there, what is that baby? Has everyone got the notes down off the board? Everyone got the notes? Ours is <coughs> electrical. That's what you that got. is in the studio. That is in the studio. I'm just going to rub that off. If you haven't got the notes. It's been a long time. Yeah. He's probably having a shit. The man. Right there. That's a long time for it. What is that on the board? We've got one of them in the studio, but what is it? 
What? It's an it's, it's not actually an analog recorder, no. ABD24. I probably said right under there, Yeah. It's not actually an analog recorder. Console? It's not a console. It is a recorder, but it's not an analog recorder. It's a digital recorder. Okay. And I'll explain why it's not an analog recorder. It's a digital recorder. Now, its name is the HD, which stands for. Not high definition. Ah, I like to think of it, but no, it's not hard high drive. definition. It's hard drive. Now, what is a hard drive? <laughs> what? It saves stuff. Point to something that's got a hard drive in it. The computer. Yeah? Computers use hard drives to store information. Yeah, they're just disks, platters, spin around really quickly and you write information onto them. What type of information gets written onto a hard drive, uh, Joe? Information. What type of information? And code. Yeah, this code. And ones and knots. Ones and knots, yeah. Finally cut. Okay. Ones and knots. So, and it's called the HD24. Now, what does 24, what's that represent? Having track. And the tracks, channels, whatever, the tracks, tracks channels, channels, whatever you want to call them, it can record 24 simultaneous inputs. So it can record 24 sound sources at the same time. As we know, you can record a drum kit, all mic'd up, guitar amps, everything, all at the same time. And it stores it here, onto this little bad boy there and there. And inside there, you know, you come to the office and you grab the hard drive. That's what it is. The hard drive is in that, inside there. Okay, and it stores the information onto the hard drive. Now, uh, Henry said, okay, Joe, do you want to leave? Huh? Do you want to leave or do you want to stay? Then quit that, please. Now, Henry said, it's an analog recorder. He was wrong because we know it's digital because it records into a hard drive, which is ones and noughts. That's digital. But can it record an analog input? Will's nodding. What do I mean by analog input? Analog is electricity, the world of electricity. Digital, ones and noughts. What does a guitar output? Does a guitar actually output sound? No. First question, does a guitar output yeah. sound? No, it does. No, it does. No, it does not output sound. Yeah, you can hear the strings vibrating. Yeah, but it doesn't output sound. You mean when you plug it in? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an electric guitar, so you plug it in, for sure. Okay, so what actually gets sent down that cable? Electricity. It's electricity, quite a few people were saying. It is electricity, sound. No, it's electricity, isn't it? Yeah, you don't go home and put your finger in the wall socket and get a tune, do you? No. <laughs> It's electricity. I just go and stick my fingers in water sockets anyway. <laughs> the thing is, we've talked about this. This, this job, this, this device here, this, it, this is this piece of equipment's job to make the sound, to convert the electrical signal from the mixing desk into sound waves. Does that make sense? Anything that's electrical, electricity driven, if you will, is what's known as analog. So, can this device record analog? Will said yes, the answer is yes. On the back here, it's quite hard to distinguish if I zoom. So it's not, I couldn't find a better. Just there it says input. And if you can see, this section here, there are 4, 8, 12, 16, 20, 24 jack sockets. Each one for your input. So if you get a guitar and you plug it into number one there, Record on channel 1, you'll see a signal. If you want to plug it from 1 and put it in 12 or whatever, and you record 12, 
You'll see the input signal there. I think I'm just going straight into the back of it. Sorry? Of course you can, yeah. In the studio, all that's happened is the output of each recording channel on the desk is just a lead going from there, round the back, and into here. And in a few weeks' time, I'm going to show you this stuff. We're going to go in the studio and have a look. There's a video of me talking about it. There's all sorts of stuff that we're going to look at. So, and then there's the output. Now, where does the output from this recorder go? Is it onto the hard drive? Sorry? Onto the hard drive? No. Nope. You plug from the mixing desk oh, back, into into, the desk. Oh. back into the desk. And what button do you have to press to listen to the output? Reverse. Yes. Yeah, when you plug your mic in and you're sending to the recorder, the signal goes into the mixing desk. Down that jet lead into the recorder. Okay, down into the recorder. Once you've recorded your track, you want to arm it, you press play, and the signal goes back into the mixing console. Thank you guys. Now, I'm quite aware of the time. This is a. Oi! Thank you. This is a digital recorder. So it records in digital, ones and nuts. So it has to convert this analog signal, which is electricity, into digital information. And again, in a few weeks' time, we're going to broach the subject of A to D conversion. And it's quite complex. Okay? But we're going to have a go at it. Analog to digital conversion. How does it get from electricity into ones and noughts? Okay? This is what happens. This device is an analog to digital converter. It takes all these analog signals, the electricity from the mixing desk, and converts it into ones and noughts to store on the hard drive. Now, can that recorder also take a digital signal? The answer is yes. And that is just here. One, two, three. And it uses something called ADAT Optical. Now, ADAT stands for Alesis. So they, they were the company that came up with the proprietary system. Alesis Digital. Uh, it's some like audio transfer, I think. It's been a while. <coughs> yeah, right, yeah. Yeah, okay. ADAT, optical. Now, optical means what? What do optical means? Optical. It's something to do with your eyes. What do our eyes respond to? Light. light. It's, it's light, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Fiber optical. Fiber optic. Yeah, fiber optical. What goes down a fiber optic cable? Light. Light. How fast does light travel? Very, very fast. It's the fastest thing we know. We don't know anything faster than light, do we? Light. <laughs> now, ADAT is very clever in that it can send eight channels of audio at the same time. Okay? And that's why there's three banks. Each one has an input and an output. So here's channels 1 to 8, 9 to 16, 17 to 24. Yeah? So you can transfer through ADA optical, which is one cable, and you send eight channels of information at the same time. And it's all done through light. And the light goes on, off, on, off, on, on, off, on, off, on, off, on. One naught, one, one naught, one, one, one naught, naught, naught. How fast? Very fast. Immensely fast. describes <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. So, this is the digital input. Okay? Much better than this. Much faster, much more reliable, ADA optical. And this is digital audio transfer. And it can do banks of eight at a time. That's why there's three banks of ADA audio. Okay. Some new monitors now come with ADA optical built in. So you can transfer from a digital device to a digital device, completely digital. So you don't ever need to convert from digital to analog then analog back to digital. You don't need to do that process. Okay. There are other 
methods that you can use up here as well. We all can talk about the functionality of this device, because we all know that you create a new project, and in that project you create a song, and you record on the tracks, and you set levels on the recorder. But there's a little bit of information about what this is and how the, the, the spec of it works. Does that make sense? It's hard disk recorder. We haven't talked about sample rates and bit depth, but again, that's a subject that requires, that requires time. And we will do that as the very last session of the year, in preparation for year two. So that will be the time when we bring a coffee and treats and sweets. We'll have, we'll have a serious morning of information. Okay. Mixing consoles. What are we going to talk about? I'm not going to talk about that because we're now in, I'm aware we're almost out of time. What kind of things are you going to talk about for mixing desks? I'm going to start with Niall. Niall's going to tell me one thing he's going to talk about when you're discussing a mixing console. Faders. Faders. Different types are? Uh, master. Master fader. Uh, channel, faders. channel faders. Oh, and really What's the other one? Darth Vader. <laughs> Very good. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> right. Channel faders, master fader, and? No auxiliary. No Group. Well done. Group faders. Can you have the mixing consoles? You can have the built in effects, yeah? You can, maybe. Phantom power. Ooh, lovely. Phantom power, what does that do? Uh, it can power. Uh, uh, Brilliant. Well, it powers condenser microphones. Harry, another feature of mixing consoles. You'll probably want to discuss for this assignment. <coughs> what one does it say? Phantom power? Yeah, phantom power. Oh. Effects. Channel uh, faders. Sorry, that was uh, the game control, yeah. What does the game control do? Controls the game. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any. Yeah, you enjoy that. Hold it. Go and where? Out. Oh. In. In. It's in the name. G A I N. In. Oh, yeah. It sets the level all this time into the console. Yeah. <coughs> that is one of the most important stages of the process. Setting good levels into the desk. Give me another one. The panning. Oh, you pan. Lovely worn out panels, left, right, stereo, field. Reversing. Reverse, yeah. Whether or not the console allows you to go to tape and from tape. Some consoles do, some consoles don't. Talk about signal flash. Yes, definitely talk about signal flash. Explain how the signal goes through the console. Down the channel strip, mate, you know, mixed bus, master out, and all that stuff. Auxiliaries. Oh, you got the chance, good. Auxiliaries. What do we use auxiliaries for in the studio? Nah, nah. 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 Short time, yeah, isn't it? Fold back. Yeah. Fold back, good. Got it, but that's okay. EQ, lovely. Yeah. On the Ghost, that's the mixing console we use in the studio, that has a four band EQ. You four at the bottom, tell me what those four bands are. One each, go. Low frequency. High frequency. Low mid and high mid, yes. And the low mid and high mid, uh, high mid, high mid are um, parametric EQs. Parametric means what? Regardless of the volume. Anybody? What does a parametric EQ do for you? Parametric. Parametric. Instead of it being a fixed frequency, oh, so you can only, like the high frequency, you can only add or take away <coughs> gain at 12 kilohertz. It's only you can choose what band. It's called a sweepable frequency, so you can actually choose the frequency. And then, 
boost or take it out. Parametric. Plus many other features. Now, three pieces, oh, of, <laughs> three pieces of studio gear, guys. There are things here for you, look, manuals and information, websites to look at, videos to watch. If you've got any problems, let me know. When do we start to work on this? Today. Nope. Tomorrow. Tomorrow in solar time. Okay. Now, John knows a lot about this stuff. So do I. So does Max. Come and speak to us. Show us what you've done. Okay? If you don't do this, you cannot pass the course. This one is one of the four outcomes for the music production unit. Okay? If you decide that you haven't got much to do over the Easter holidays, you have now. Okay? That's quite all right. Now, I am still waiting. The backline tech, you've got to add something. You've got everything for yours now? Yeah, I'm going to go. Oh, calm down. Oh, look. Backline tech. I'm still writing that DVD as well. It's you, so. No backline tech. Let's get on it. You've got my backline tech now, I've got the paperwork and the videos. Yours, good. Harry. Backline tech. Yeah. I've got a video. Don't have a reason, I'm just saying I haven't had it. No, it is. Oh, do we have to hand in this as well? Yes. How many times do I have to say this? I, know, I got really confused yes. last week. Front sheet, all paperwork prints off, videos oh, on no, disc. No, 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 no. Joe, yes. nothing from you, Joe Harris. Quaid, yes. had yours. Yes. Will? Yes. Ollie, had yours. John? You've got all your paperwork, yeah. but not videos. Yeah, um, you know the CD you made, mate? I left it in the machine. <coughs> I, I forgot, I didn't put it down, I left it flat. And then I had that meeting on that, so I tried to get it back out, and it had like, gone inside. Or someone try again, get another disc, try again. That's all I can say. Those excuses, though. I was like, 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 I was like,